Welcome to Awake and Activate. In this episode of Awake and Activate, we're going to talk about the lots that were cast in the Bible, rune stones, the Ark of the Covenant, and try and bridge the gap between Christians thinking they are sinners born into sin and um, have no no chance uh, and the separation that is made between people to try and use a little education and background to understand that we are all born into this world with the divine breath of life and it is given to each and every one of us and creator source god almighty who is on the throne eternally who will never be overthrown loves and loves unconditionally looks at us as beautiful children flaws and all it's our uniqueness and all the divine gifts we have not been left here defenseless and how when Christ came, the good news, and who he was talking to. Let's think about that. He was talking to what would be deemed as, you know, the deplorables or the sinners. What could he possibly have been telling them that freed them from so many different bondages, healed the sick, and brought joy to their life. Something to think about. So let me present this information to you and uh, we'll see what you guys think. What does it mean to cast lots in the Bible? Credit Adriana Varela Photography slash Moment slash Getty Images. Christian Book Bibles. Everything Christian for Less at www.christianbook.com slash Bibles KJV, NKJV, NIV, ESV Large Print, Compact, Study, Journaling, Kids and More The practice of casting lots was completed by throwing sticks or stones with markings or symbols into a closed-off space to determine the will of God. It was used by Jews throughout the Old Testament, and even Jesus Christ's disciples in the New Testament until Pentecost. The way that the lots landed would be interpreted by someone present, usually a person considered close to God or learned in scripture. The casting of lots was typically used when a big decision had to be made but there was insufficient information or guidance in the scriptures. Throughout the Bible, neither God nor Jesus nor any agent of them denounced casting lots, but after Pentecost, which is said to have brought the presence of the Holy Spirit to God's people to help guide them, the casting of lots was no longer necessary. Rune Stones Each individual rune is thought to be a symbolic storehouse and a magical talisman having its own unique set of meanings. Background Rune stones are a set of 24 ancient alphabetic symbols, which are believed to have originated from the northern parts of Europe sometime during the Paleolithic times. As well as being alphabetic in nature, they are regarded by many as a symbology which is far more powerful in communication than the mortal words that we use today. There is an apparent link between the power of the mind, as well as other magical properties, which are represented by the symbology contained within each symbolic letter. For these reasons, their use has evolved throughout the ages, and they are seen being commonly used today for Divination Decision making Communication As the runes spread throughout Europe by the Anglo-Saxons, the runic alphabet which was quite varied in number depending upon geographical location, finally became settled into a basic alphabet of 24 runes called the Futhark. The word F-U-T-H-A-R-K originates from the sounds of the six letters. 
the 24 runic signs are arranged into three families comprising eight runes each. These individual families are called eat, singular, or eater, plural, each family or eat is ruled over by its own particular spirit or Norse god. Respectively these entities are Freya and Frey, goddess and god of fertility and increase. Heindal, the watcher and the keeper of the rainbow bridge to the heavens. Tyr, war leader and spirit of the just. The sequence of signs in each eat has meaning as does each rune within it. Each individual rune is thought to be a symbolic storehouse and a magical talisman having its own unique set of meanings connecting a variety of things including, feelings, experiences, spirits, objects, creatures, and archetypal processes. Almost like the makeup of an inner reality their movements in any given situation are said to be indicative of how wind or fate is operating in an individual's affairs. The meanings of the runes are however quite fluid. Although old texts do give sets of associations for the signs there is still quite an amount that is left up to the interpretation and intuition of the individual using them. How to cast runes? Runes are cast ideally on an east-west axis or facing the sun. A white cloth is laid down and used to determine the shot or direction of the casting. From here the focus should lie with the pressing question. The runes should then be drawn or cast from either a box or leather pouch where they should normally be kept. After casting the stones onto the cloth the ones which have fallen the right side up are red and depending upon whether the rune is reversed or not will have a bearing upon its meaning and the reading as a whole. Click here to read about the meanings and interpretations of each rune stone. An alternative to casting the rune stones. Pick a rune stone randomly for a day reading. You can also do what is known as a three rune spread. Some feel that the day rune is a good way to get an answer to a single question. The three rune spread is used for asking broader questions whereas the single rune can be drawn on a daily basis. The Ark of the Covenant, Symbol of Divine Guidance By, Gaia Staff February 12, 2016 if you're able to contemplate the Ark of the Covenant and not think about melting Nazis, then you're more sophisticated than I am. I fully admit that until I saw Raiders of the Lost Ark in the early 80s, I had no idea what the Ark of the Covenant was, but it caught my imagination. I wasn't the only person who was inspired to research the Ark after the film. It became a fascination for many and a full-blown obsession for some. Of course, None of the interest in the Ark of the Covenant could match the sudden passion for fedoras, bullwhips and bomber jackets. In some ways, it was a silly time. Over the years, there's been much conjecture about the Ark. What was it really? Where is it now? Who made it? Why was it designed the way it was? Many of these questions were offshoots of the theory that it was a device designed by ancient astronauts. Fortunately, that theory is mostly forgotten, although it's pulled out of the attic, every now and then, and dusted off. Questions regarding its true design and purpose are purely conjectural and can't possibly be known. I reject the idea that there's anything extraterrestrial about it. If it were designed by alien gods, then why didn't they give it a method of self-propulsion, or at least wheels, rather than having to be carried around by four burly fellows? I'm only partially joking, here. Some believe it to be the actual power of God, transmitted to the earth through the ark, specifically at the mercy seat, the space between the two cherubim on the lid. This presupposes a belief in the Judeo-Christian stories about the ark, described in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and they may be totally correct. Without the ark itself, the mystery will have to remain mysterious. I wouldn't want it any other way. Over the millennia, religious relics have been a massive draw for the faithful. Pieces of the true cross, bones of saints, textiles, thorns, vials of blood, body parts, and almost anything else that can be imagined, including tortillas, have been held in great reverence by true believers. They connect followers to their faith and become earthly proxies for the power of God. Accounts of miraculous healing and spiritual visions are frequent when in the presence of a holy relic. 
In fact, some of these relics have had a huge influence on Western culture, perhaps none more so than the Holy Grail and the Spear of Long Inus. The Grail Mythos was a powerful inspiration for great works of art, operas, classic stories of knights and chivalry and even a modern story about a worldwide conspiracy to hide the existence of the descendants of Jesus. The Spear of Long Inus, also known as the Spear of Destiny, was supposedly the lance that pierced the side of Christ while upon the cross. This relic was sought after and apparently acquired by Adolf Hitler. Interestingly enough, there's no historic proof that Hitler, or his Reich, ever searched for the Ark of the Covenant. It sure made for a great movie, though. What was the Ark and why was it so important? According to sacred teachings, Moses ascended to the top of Mount Sinai for 40 days and met with God, where he received the Ten Commandments. When he returned to the base of the mountain and to his people, he was angered to discover that the Hebrews had fled Egypt, only to fall back into idolatrous ways. Moses threw the tablets and they shattered. He then was instructed to create another set of tablets for God to inscribe. The Ark was designed and revealed to Moses with specific materials and dimensions mandated. Once created, it was set to hold the shards of the first tablets of the commandments, as well as the new ones. Eventually, depending upon which sacred text is read, it held not only the tablets, but also Aaron's rod, manna, and anointing oil. As such, it would have held the most sacred relics of modern monotheism, other than faith itself. It was said that God could appear and speak through the Ark, specifically on the Mercy Seat. It was carried about half a mile ahead of the Israelites as they traveled, always covered. The Ark wasn't very large. It would have been about 3 feet 9 inches long, by 2 feet 3 inches wide. It had four rings, one at each corner, designed to hold poles for the transport of the, the Ark. It was said to be made of shittim wood, what we now know as acacia. This wood is indigenous to the desert area of the Holy Lands. It's dense and and therefore extremely strong. It's also beautiful when worked, giving a lovely variance of colors. Other valuable objects were made of acacia, but the Ark was then covered with gold, inside and out. The lid was made of solid gold and completed with the images of two cherubim facing each other. Some authors have speculated that it was made of gold to make it more conductive electrically. Although that may be the case, it makes more sense to use gold, because the items within were the holiest earthly relics of the faith. Gold doesn't tarnish and is the metal of the sun, the very face of life force on this planet. To use anything but gold would make no sense. Sacred literature tells of the Ark being carried around the walls of Jericho, once a day for seven days and seven shofars, ram horn trumpets, being blown. After seven days, the walls came a-tumbling down, as the song says. Who's to say it didn't happen? Who knows what sort of awesome power the Ark held, or commanded within the minds and hearts of its keepers. One of the more interesting tales of the Ark of the Covenant has to do with its capture by the Philistines. They took the Ark home to Philistia and the troubles began. Anywhere the Ark was housed, the populace became plagued by hemorrhoids and the city infested with mice. After a five-city tour, and after the Ark caused the mutilation of a statue dedicated to a patron deity, Dagon, the Philistines decided to return the Ark to the Israelites. Along with it, they sent a guilt offering of five gold mice and five gold hemorrhoids, yes, hemorrhoids. There are some who consider the hemorrhoids to actually be buboes from the plague, while others presume them to be tumors. I'll go with hemorrhoids. There's something horrifically personal about having an entire city suffer from such an affliction. It makes perfect sense to me and it did the job. There are numerous theories as to what the Ark of the Covenant really was. Some think it a communication device for aliens. Some consider it to be the dwelling place on earth of God and a protector of the Israelites. Others think it may have been a weapon of massive destructive power, one that needed to always be covered to keep it from being lethal to the innocent. Some think it was a battery, capable of generating electricity. There are those who don't think the Ark existed at all, 
believing it to be purely allegorical. Others look to it as a powerful device to be revealed and used at the end of our tenure on this planet. I don't worry about such things, though. I'll admit to not having a clue. Where is the Ark of the Covenant now? That's a darn good question. According to scripture, it was returned to the temple in Jerusalem and that's pretty much the end of non-apocryphal history, other than a reference to it being in heaven. Some believe that King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon eventually stole it. Others believe it was hidden near the Dead Sea. Many believe it to be in a church in Ethiopia, although no one is allowed to see it, other than the monks charged with its safety. I'll bet that there are even some who believe it was deposited in the well of the souls in the lost city of Tanis, by the ancient Egyptian king, Shishak, where it was eventually rediscovered by an American archaeologist, stolen from him by Nazis and eventually found its way into a warehouse in the United States. I don't have a theory of what it really was, or what it was used for. I can't offer an opinion as to its resting place, or if it ever existed at all. I will say that the world is richer for the Ark of the Covenant and what it stands for, the concept of faith and divine guidance. It inspires those who believe and it serves as a beacon of light for those who seek scriptural history. For those who love unsolved mysteries, its tantalizing questions spur creativity and debate. It fuels the power of imagination and floods the mind with endless possibilities, for in the presence of such mystery, the joy of being human is fully realized. I wish you all peace and love. As we just went through runestones, lots, and the Ark of the Covenant, all three have one thing in common, and that is that all three were used for divination. Now, we're told that divination is something we should never do. And we do have the Holy Spirit indwelling where we don't need to use tools. If we don't think we need them, we don't need them. Now, I've never used runestones. I've never cast lots. I've never used tarot cards. But that doesn't mean that other people do not use such tools to strengthen their God-given gifts that they have within them. So I'm not going to judge them for what they use in order to get whatever they need to convince themselves that everything that they need and seek is within them. Remember, we are all born after Christ. And we're at a time now where we are remembering the gospel, the good news. The rainbow is proof in itself as the chakra system is the rainbow, which is represented in every person that is walking around. We are all walking rainbows. Let's talk a little bit about the Ark of the Covenant. I wanted to add that the poles that they had to carry this object by were wooden. Ask any electrician if another fellow electrician gets zapped and is being held, he is not to grab on to the one that is being shocked. He is to grab something wooden and pry him away. They had to carry it with the wooden poles. And as they walked, even the static from them walking would build up a charge enough that if they accidentally touched it, they could drop dead right there on the spot. Think about the preparations that the priest class had to go through in order to get close to the Ark of the Covenant. They had to go through what they called a ritualistic cleansing. And if they did anything wrong, when they came close to the Ark of the Covenant, they would drop dead. They had them wear pomegranates around the edges of their garment with little bells in them, where it would make a sound 
that if they dropped, they would hear the bells so they could pull on the rope. Oh yes, they had a rope around their ankle so they could pull them out away from the Ark of the Covenant. So, what was the Ark of the Covenant? What did it actually do? Why did the Israelites have the Ark of the Covenant ahead of them whenever they were going to do battle? Why did they carry it around the walls of Jericho when they were blowing the trumpets? What did that object actually do? I'm not denying that the Ark of the Covenant is in existence because I truly believe that it is. I believe it's been hidden for a reason. It may have actually been tumors that these people broke out with when you don't know how to properly care and store this item it could have let off radiation which would draw the mice in to the decaying or dying people and also cause tumors to break out on their body that's just using common sense anyways the point of this video is to bridge the gap and also to, as I have was brought up as a Christian, being told since I was wee high that I was a sinner and being in this flesh is a curse instead of the blessing that it is that God breathed life into me, making me the unique divine being just like you. We all come from the one the one has shared his very essence, her very essence. You know, we can't put a sex on God, on the creator. That's minimalizing. But I can say this, when you need the father's love, you will get fatherly love. When you need a maternal motherly love, you will get maternal motherly love. God is all in all, everything and loves us unconditionally. And that is what we are to do. We are to love God with all of our heart, mind, body, and spirit, soul, and everything, and love our neighbors as ourselves. Now, how can you love yourself if you're constantly thinking you are not worthy, that you are a sinner, and that you need to go pay your 10% and eat the body and drink the blood of a man who was savagely beaten and put upon a cross for the very teachings that he was teaching for over three and a half years before they pulled him in. What was he doing? And why was it that he was talking to people that, like I said earlier, would be considered deplorables unsavable, unworthy. A lot of them weren't even allowed in the temple unless they could purchase the animal to be sacrificed for their sins, blood sacrifice. Now that reminds me of an old God from the Old Testament that wanted child sacrifice or blood sacrifice, which we all know that that was a fake God. When you think about what happened in the garden, we were all created beings. Another created being wanted to be worshipped. And with their sovereignty and their divine abilities, out of innocence and naivety, we fell. We allowed ourselves to be subjugated. Well, I'm here to tell you, my friends, that we are here now to remember the gospel to remember what Christ was teaching and to restore and come back I don't need the tools I've never used the tools but that doesn't mean that the gifts don't pour out of me just like they can you I sought for Christ I found him within I got what I called the Holy Spirit baptism it was a life-changing event as everything clicked open within me. Now I constantly maintain a relationship. It's a communication 
It's a back and forth. I will pray and meditate on things that I'm not quite understanding. Just like the message that I got earlier today. When I get the answers, a lot of times I am busy with other things. So it's like my mind is off of it. And then all of a sudden, the answers will flow in. God has a sense of humor. But with that said, with good solid prayer from the heart that is for the benefit of all mankind, which is when you learn, and I had to learn to love myself. When I'm thinking I'm a dirty rotten sinner and I'm not worthy of anything, I had to learn that that was not true. All, every, all the programs that everything had to come out, anything that no longer served had to come off and out. Now, I follow Christ. Christ will lead you to all truths. And that's my belief. And I'm not going to impose my belief onto you. Because the journey, the path that I have been on has shown me the divine within everybody. It's about love, loving. If you love your enemy as yourself, even that was told we, Christ told us to do that you don't have any enemies and you forgive everybody because unconditional love is just that unconditional love and when you feel that inpouring that that relationship of that unconditional love coming into you of course it's gonna pour back out you're gonna reflect the God you serve if you are judgmental or, you know, trying to say your way is the only way and, you know, you can tell when people are still confused about, you know, who they are truly. But there's hope because just like when that uh, huge awakening happened in 2015 and 16, we've got another one coming up because the same scripts the same programs are running again. And with that comes a huge awakening. Sometimes people need to think that there is going to be an asteroid that hits because you know they're waiting for prophecy to be fulfilled, which would be wormwood. Well, that has happened over and over and over again. But each time, more and more people wake up to who and what they are. Realize your inheritance. Go back to your first estate. You are loved unconditionally. You have all the gifts within you. You want to use tools? Use them. A lot of times people want people to use tools for validation. A lot of times people are seeking validation, but I promise you, everything is within you. Christ resides on the throne of your heart, and you get your heart and your mind and everything lined out. And just like the toroidal field I showed you the other day, that's what we are. We are colorful rainbows, and we just extend out far. Now, if we have a dent in our armor or any kind of misinformation, it shows. And those with the eyes to see can see that. So realize this. You are beautiful. You are unique. You are divine. You are loved unconditionally by God Almighty, creator of all. We have so much to look forward to as we are all remembering we're remembering Christ's teachings. We're remembering what the true good news actually is. We're coming out from the control matrix and we're going into a new understanding, programming our own reality. Yeah. And one that's going to be good and beneficial to all because regardless of your status in any community we are all equal all of us
No matter what gifts or abilities anybody has going on, we're all equals. There's nothing that they're doing that you cannot do yourself. You just have to want it, you have to seek it, and you shall have it. Even in scripture, father says, you know, what kind of father when his child asks for a fish that he gives a snake or a Scorpio? Think about it. Just wanted to share this information with you because I think it's important that we're trying, we try to bridge this gap so we come together as equals in love in unconditional love and unconditional forgiveness. So with that, share what you know and listen so we can grow. We are in this together. If you're wanting to know why I'm getting these videos and I'm gonna set them all up, we're looking at some uh, possible power outages. So I don't want you to think that I win anywhere. So if I do not happen to make the premiere it's probably because our power is out. But it's okay, because I have faith that you'll be there. Okay, well, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. And if you would like to support the channel, the links are down in the description, uh, the, the description box. <laughs> Ten tied. I love you guys. Have yourself a wonderful weekend. Peace. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you.